Hi, this is Dr. Wood and I would like to welcome you to the week three lecture. This week we will continue our exploration of the elements of a short story. This week's reading assignment in Reading and Writing About Literature gives us a lot of great information about analyzing the elements of a short story to understand the entire story. A good story can relate to our lives. Each reader interprets the story through an individual filter. For example, a medical professional would likely interpret the story, the yellow wallpaper, differently than someone who does not work as a medical professional. As you write your papers for this class, please remember that your analysis of literary works is unique to you. No one will look at these stories, poems, or plays in the same way that you do. Things to look for when analyzing literature are plot, character, point of view, setting, theme, symbolism, and style. Since I got these elements from the textbook, I documented that with an MLA in text citation. However, since they were not together in a list, all in the same place, I did not need to use quote marks. And as we go on, we want to choose the most important elements to analyze when writing a paper about fiction. You probably cannot analyze all of the elements in one paper, so you should choose just the maybe three or four most important elements in the story. And in our chapter, we have two stories and a sample essay. So we have a treasure trove of information about writing an analytical paper about two literary works, which is coincidentally somewhat similar to your paper one reading, uh, pardon me, writing assignment. Please pay particular attention to the questions about the stories near the end of the chapter. Those could help you analyze your stories. And you may disagree with the student's ana analysis of these stories in our chapter, and that's okay. Your papers will be different than anyone else's papers. As we read the story The Necklace by Guy de Maupassant, consider what the theme of the story might be. Who is Matilda Loisel? Why does she want to borrow a necklace? Is that all she wants, or does she want something else? And what does she think the necklace will bring her? And what does that necklace actually bring her? So as you read literature, um, questions can come into your mind and hopefully the story will answer them or sometimes the story will just bring more questions. And then what does this story possibly have to do with us in our modern world? And there are some telling details in the necklace like most stories. And so these details can kind of foreshadow what's going to happen next or help us understand more richly what is going on. And so we have some telling details here, such as these quotes. Matilda had no dowry, no hopes, no means of becoming known, appreciated, loved, and married by a man either rich or distinguished. Notice here that I have quote marks because this is directly quoted from the story, and I have also documented it with the author's last name and the page number. So this is how I would document a quotation from a source in MLA style. And this quotation tells us what Matilda believes her problem is or what the narrator is telling us her problem is. And then Matilda married a petty clerk, which is not a very nice way to talk about someone's job, and felt that she was wasting her inborn finesse, instinctive elegance, and her suppleness of wit. Notice that I have made a few minor changes to this quotation to make it fit into my sentence. I took out some information I thought was not really important, and so I took that out and it did not change the meaning of the quotation. So I put an ellipsis here and then I put in um, brackets and I put in a couple of words that helped it fit into my sentence better without changing the meaning here. And their apartment had shabby walls, worn chairs, and faded furniture. So Matilda is not living the lifestyle that she thought she should live as she goes on through her life. And her husband tried to make her happy and got them an invitation to a fancy society ball and in the process ended up giving up the 400 francs he had saved for a gun so he could go out and mingle with um, some of the men so that she could have a new gown. 
and then she wanted jewelry to adorn herself. So he got her the invitation, he gave her money for the gown, and then she still wanted something else. And then she went to her friend, Mrs. Forestier, who offered to lend her some jewelry and had no hesitation, none at all, about lending her the superb necklace of diamonds, saying, why, yes, certainly, when Matilda asked for it. Now, why was um, her friend so fine with lending out such a valuable piece of jewelry? Uh, perhaps this is a little bit of a hint or foreshadowing. And then after the ball, Matilda was in a hurry to leave, uh, not wanting the other guests to see their shabby outerwear, so she's always kind of worried about appearances. So they walked for quite a while in the cold near the river before hiring a shabby carriage to take them as far as their door in Martyr Street. And it might be helpful if you're not familiar with the word martyr uh, to look up some possible meanings for that. So why do they live on Martyr Street? That's a very interesting street name. And then we can transition, uh, rather, a whole different world to a Wagner matinee. And this story has two settings, the elegant city of Boston and a rough homestead in Red Willow County, Nebraska. And these two settings, I believe, are very important elements of the story. And characters include the narrator, Clark, and his aunt, Georgiana, who taught him Latin and also gave him his first Shakespeare and her old textbook on mythology meaning probably Greek and Roman mythology, when he was a young boy living with her family. Again, we have a direct quote, including this unusual spelling of Shakespeare's name, and I have put quote marks around it and cited it here with an MLA in text citation. And the story is set in two distinct time periods as well, Clark's present day and the shared past they had when he stayed at the farm with her family. And Aunt Georgiana was a music teacher at the Boston Conservatory when she was young, but then she got married, moved to Nebraska, and had to leave music behind for at least 15 years. And then Clark has made this choice to take his aunt to a mat matinee of Wagner compositions, and he is remembering her teaching him to play the organ at the farm, and she's remembering her past when she taught in a grand school in Boston at the conservatory. And so I have given us at least one performance that you can listen to in our resources this week, and that could give you a glimpse of the power of the music, as well as the mythology behind Wagner's Ring Cycle, which is based on a different type of mythology, Norse mythology, which included Vikings and Valkyries, and this is a very stylized picture of a Viking here that I thought you'd enjoy. And so, how does the story end? Matilda Loisel's story ends with a surprise. How could her story have ended differently? What would you have to say about the way the necklace ended compared with the way the cask of Amontillado ended? What do you think happened to Aunt Georgiana after the ending of a Wagner matinee when she sat crying in the theater and said, I don't want to go, Clark. I don't want to go. And we kind of have to think about where does she not want to go? Back to his house? Or is it back to the farm? And did she go back home to Nebraska? And where was her true home? Was that part of the main point of the story? And then we had a slightly different story this week. Mark Twain's the Notorious Jumping Frog of Calaveras County is a bit different than most of the short stories we might study in a literature class. Uh, Mark Twain, who was born with the name Samuel L. Clemens, was quite a character himself, and he's fairly familiar to many people who live in Missouri because he spent most of his boyhood in Hannibal, Missouri, and then he traveled far and wide, including to St. Louis, up and down the Mississippi River as a riverboat captain, and then to California at one point where he wrote this story and began to become a famous author. Also, if you've never seen or touched a giant bullfrog, you've really missed an unforgettable experience. And why has this story endured? It doesn't seem like it's all that serious, uh, but it has a mythology of its own. There's a notorious jumping frog of Calaveras County um, contest every year. 
um, in the same area where he wrote this story, Angel's Camp. And the story is set during the American Gold Rush, which was an exciting time in history. And his use of dialect and humor draw in the audience, and his descriptions are vivid and unforgettable. And then the characters are unusual, including the crabby and reluctant narrator. There's not too many stories where you have the narrator basically telling you he doesn't want you to tell this story, and it's kind of stupid. Um, and then Mark Twain's image has been kept alive for current audiences in um, Calaveras County and, of course, in Missouri. If you ever visit Hannibal, you'll notice that it is very geared toward Mark Twain um, and everything he did that brought the city to um, world attention. And so is there a deeper theme in this story about the frog, a hidden meaning or two, or is that big old bullfrog just a big old bullfrog? And then I put a works cited list on our presentation this week, and I made sure that it's in alphabetical order by author, or in this case, by article title. And I have the article titles or essay titles or um, in here in the uh, works cited list so that you can tell that this is Willa Cather's story. And then we have the name of the, the book that it's in. And I even put that it's a Kindle edition because I'm using the ebook edition. And so this is what a works cited list should look like, double spaced, reverse indented, and with the word words works cited at the top. So I thought I would add this so that you get a pretty good idea of how your works cited should look for your papers. I hope you have a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye.